Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for another great UC Maximus Grand Rounds. I'm Scott Kovner and I'm joined by... I'm Brett Guest. I had a tiny back. human. You had a tiny human. Welcome <laughs> back. It's been a while. It's been a while. It's really good to be back. I'm so excited for tonight's show. We're super excited to have you and we're excited to kick off Urgent Care in 2023. Whoop, whoop. Let's so do who it. do we have tonight with us, Britt? We have an incredible faculty lineup. We've got Sean Nort, who, I mean, he really looks like a movie star in that photo. I love it. We've got Jess Mason in the house, so excited, and Swami. I mean, it's an all-star lineup. And, of course, we got Mike and Gita, our urgent care masters. Of course, pre-recorded in. Wouldn't be a complete night without them. We need them, really. 100% we do. So just a reminder, if you're joining us for the first time, or maybe you've been here a few times before, to click on the doobly-doo down below to go ahead and subscribe to the channel. You can hit the little ring bell on the side there to get notified when we go live because you got a lot of things going on in your life. We know this isn't on your calendar all the time, even though it should be. It's nice to get a little <laughs> notification when Everyone we go live. Everyone should remember all yeah, the time. I mean, this is the only thing I have. I got that and haircuts on my calendar. So um, <laughs> anyways, uh, subscribe. And we also have started a mailing list for Grand Rounds at the end of the show. And the links below will also put that mailing list. So if you want to get any in-between the scenes updates or get a notification before any of this stuff starts out, um, it could be in your inbox if that's a preferred way of reaching you. Love Pretty it. Good. Pretty easy way. So why don't we jump into our headlines and bottom lines of the evening, some of the right. news from around the web, around the world. It's been a few weeks. Let's do it. So here it is, headlines and bottom lines. So this the first article coming up, right, is something that I think is near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's going to be near and dear to your heart as well. Yeah. Um, it was a opinion piece in the New York Times um, by Eric Reinhardt um, that basically was talking about not just burnout, but basically how as physicians we are sort of encountering the healthcare system and some of the deleterious effects that we've had, the moral injury, I should say, over yep. the past few years that we've kind of gone through. Um, this was, uh, to me, it's an amazing article. If you haven't read it already, 100% go read it. Um, I think it captures a lot of the sentiment that we've all been feeling, but this takeaway, this one bit in the middle of the article um, really spoke out to me. Um, what's burning out healthcare workers is less the grueling conditions we practice under and more our dwindling faith in the systems for which we work. Uh, and I think really reframing the problem is not being burnout, you know, how many clicks in Epic or, you know, how much time that you're spending on shift and really the fact that when I leave a shift and I'm helping to navigate a patient through a crumbling healthcare infrastructure, uh, that really weighs on me. I, I don't know if you yeah. feel the same way. I mean, I think, you know, it, we've all been through COVID. We made it out to kind of the other side if we're saying the pandemic is really done. And, you know, we have our patients and we do this because of patient care. We love patient care. It's not the patients. It's not that work. It's getting them the care that they need after the ER. You know, we can only go so far and trying to navigate this system. It's tough. Even as physicians that should know this system really well, it's very tough, especially, you know, if a patient needs follow up with podiatry and they're like maybe going to see them in six months. Totally. And I really think that this article was really a call to action for us as, you know, healthcare providers, as physicians to really take charge, grassroots organize and start making the changes that we want to see in the healthcare system and realize that it's probably our time to be a little bit more politically active, a little bit more involved in the administration of healthcare at a larger systems level as we clearly see the system falling apart in front of us. I think this dovetails really nicely with another New York Times piece from The Daily. Uh, I don't know if you listen to The Daily every day. I love The Daily. So do I. <laughs> it's a great way to wake up. Um, but this piece on nonprofit healthcare systems um, and some of the kind of shady finances that have been going on, which I'm sure we've all encountered in whatever healthcare environment that we work in, um, I think is another really strong call to action for us to kind of like wake up and, you know, help make some changes in the systems, especially, you know, this article, or sorry, this podcast episode talked about patients essentially being shaken down for free care, care that they're legally entitled to receive for free. Um, pretty rough stuff. Yeah. But Check it out. Um, I think it's just important. Um, and it's certainly been tweeted about a whole lot in the last few weeks. Uh, it's been a really interesting discussion online if you've been following it there. All right. To another headline. Are you ready for this one, Britt? I'm ready. What is it? All right. Do you like doing fluorescein exams? I actually do. You do. You have a cobalt blue light everywhere you go. No, I do you not. You carry it in your back pocket. I, I like know doing do. the exam. I've seen it in your back pocket. You have an ophthalmoscope, <laughs> and you bring the tuning fork to shift still. It's just in my purse. Yeah. No, I, I like doing it. Can I always do it? No. Do I always have the resources to, resource to do it? Absolutely not. Yeah, if you can actually find the ophthalmoscope, if you have a functioning slit lamp, God knows if you've ever seen a wood lamp before. I have no idea. I thought it was made out of wood for like three years because I, I had never seen one. Um, <laughs> no, but... it's just a, it, it does exist. It's out there. It probably has 
cobwebs and you haven't used it in a while, but it's there. This is a, a great little article um, published in Academic Emergency Medicine um, that came out, uh, I think, in November of 2022 um, that talked about basically using an iPhone app to project that cobalt blue color uh, from, you know, the clinician's hand to be able to visualize fluorescein stain, which is great. Like, I think, I mean... I'd be lying if I haven't used my phone light as a pen light before because I don't okay. lose my phone, but I've probably been through 50 pen lights in my time. Uh, another great functionality you might be able to add to a device we carry with us at all times. And like you hinted at, in resource like low settings mm -hmm. might be something that can be deployed. There. I mean, this would this would be incredible in low resource settings because you're not going to get a slit lamp there. And a lot of places, even in ERs here where I work, I go for the slit lamp. The bulb's broken. It's not working today. Somebody can't find it. It's being used somewhere else. And having this accessible, because honestly, the woods lamp can get you in the right direction, but it, it's just not that great. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to point out, like, I totally agree. There's going to be hopefully some more studies on technology like this. This was just kind of like a, hey, this is really cool. Look what we did paper. It's not really like a rigorous study on like any sensitivity, specificity of using this technology. But, um, but this, could be, this could really be helpful. Be really if cool. you have no other resource, you have no other slit lamp or Listen, light to use, I'm looking I'm forward to it. the day where, you know, grandma comes in. She had a mechanical slip and fall because the Apple Watch told us she was an AFib and we use our iPhone <laughs> to then find the corneal abrasion <laughs> that she got when she, you know, hit her face in the ground. Look, it's all in one full package. Circle. Full circle there. <laughs> All right, uh, another headline or thing that you might have actually been using at home and hearing about in the press, uh, chat GPT. Um, there's been a few people in healthcare really interested in writing about the rise of artificial intelligence and specifically chat GPT, which is, I don't know if you've ever played with it, Britt. It's, I've played with it before. Have you used it before for anything healthcare related? I haven't used it for anything legitimately healthcare related because I don't think it's it's there. It's we not can, there yet, no. right? <laughs> but it's pretty interesting. I encourage you know people watching to check it out, play with it. You could put in like discharge instructions for a sprained ankle from the urgent care and it does an amazing job of writing a little note that you you know could potentially edit and think about including in something that you provide um, you could also ask it to review articles for you and things like that but you know obviously there's been a lot of focus on what does this mean for clinicians mm -hmm. these rising AI tools and you know there's all this fear of the future I think that it conjures up like what are we going to do what's our role in this changing reality and I want to just pause and remind people that artificial intelligence in active clinical care has been around for some time. This yeah. is the list of the currently 520 FDA approved applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning and enabled devices being practiced in the United States today. Um, and it's something that I think, as my personal opinion, can only advance our care. Now, again, a lot of these things here are saying radiology, you can see on the side. Um, there's been a lot of research done in helping radiologists detect subtle fractures and other things. Um, which I think it would be a great adjunct. I'd love to have, you know, the top of the EKG machine give me something other than a lawsuit if I used it alone <laughs> to read it. Um, not the most reliable read. Not the most reliable read. Uh, but I think there's Folks have a lot of fear about this stuff um, or where it could be going. And the way I think about it is this, uh, not, this is Star Trek, Brit, not Star Wars, as uh, we had talked in right before I the show began. I didn't call it Star Wars. You it's call okay. it Star Wars. It's okay. That's weird. You know, Beverly Crusher. <laughs> That's, that's my girl, you know, chief medical officer of the Enterprise. But anyways, like in the Lady search, in Blue Blazer. Yeah, Lady in Blue Blazer, <laughs> as she's also known. Um, you know, like in, in sci-fi, we always talk about these tools that doctors have that to us look absolutely insane. And I feel like if a doctor from like the 1800s looked at Corpendium, their mind would be blown that we have access Book to all those clinical... online? Yeah. What? Or even like clinical decision aids and stuff. So I think it's just going to be a tool that we adapt and learn how to use and will help enhance the care that we provide. But certainly if you haven't checked it out already, Keep an eye on it. It's something that might be coming to an emergency department and urgent care wherever you're practicing from uh, your clinical environment near you. All right. Those are our headlines and bottom lines. How do we do, Britt? I think we did pretty good. We covered a lot. We did we cover covered a lot. lot. There's things that maybe aren't ready for prime time, but we may start to see in the future. I like that. Sure. Um, now we're going to turn to our clinical image, and we're going to do a little bit of a different spin on this. Okay. Instead of a couple images, we're going to focus on one, and we're going to let our urgent care experts kind of tackle it first before we dive into conversation. So we got Mike and Gita on the line? We got Mike and Gita, maybe pre-recorded. Pre-recorded. A little I love bit pre-recorded. Um, so I want to set the scene for this image. You have a 55-year-old guy. He works in construction. Um, no medical problems that he knows of. He doesn't go to the doctor all that often, though. Um, and he's had this rash kind of really noticeably on his hands, maybe over the last three, four months, kind of comes and goes. But today, it's really painful. It's kind of itchy. He's never seen a doctor before, so mm. he's like, Doc, what, what is this? Pops yeah. into your urgent care. Let's take a look at this image and see what Mike and Gita think. Let's see what they have to say. That is a very unhappy looking 
hand when you say Mike. <laughs> I do not want my hands to look like that. Definitely not. So I think looking at this, um, it looks scaly. Um, it sounds like it's very itchy. I would bet that this didn't just materialize overnight. Um, and so if this patient told me that it was much more of a chronic condition, then I would think something along the lines of uh, palma plantar or dishydrotic eczema. I, I don't think, I think dishydrotic eczema, like usually you think about the little bubbles, vesicles under the skin, the super, super itchy, those spongiosis kind of fluid filled things. But then when it gets more chronic, it starts to look more like this. What do you think? You, you know, Gideon, you said something really important, which is how long this has been going on. Because when you think of an urgent care and the time that we have, right, to ask questions, well, we're not asking every single question in the textbook that it's recommending that we ask, right? We're asking those high impact type of questions. So yeah, this started yesterday. I'm thinking of some sort of irritant dermatitis, right? Like they were exposed to some sort of chemicals or washing their hands with some sort of soap, maybe even that they were allergic to, right? But a longer term type of process, maybe you know months or years, I would think maybe they've seen some sort of dermatologist or someone in the past. They've tried medication, maybe a, a steroid or some sort of augmented type of steroid cream or ointment that they put on their hands. And something like dishydrotic eggs would be really important. But, you know, before we started recording this, we talked a little bit about some of those special situations in palms and soles. Not exactly like this picture, but you had a really nice differential for things that we think about when there's abnormalities of the palms and soles dive into that differential. I mean, really, we see a lot of rashes, but we when you see a lot of rashes, but when you see it on the hands, you really have to start thinking about some specific things. What do you think about? Well, of course, anytime you, you hear weird rash hands, you're thinking syphilis. Syphilis right? is making a comeback. Be there. Right? It is making, <laughs> it's a, making right? a comeback. <laughs> Everything old is new again. So yeah, so that that is it. Uh, the history is construction. I'm a toxicologist, right, I, in addition. I feel like we're going into some tox, some chemicals. So one thing, yeah. So, and Mike had kind of mentioned this, where you think about a contact dermatitis, particularly if it's bilateral in an even distribution, I'm thinking about that. And that could very easily be someone who's been handling concrete mm -hmm. without any protective gear. But the, what's important for me is if it's a contact dermatitis or some chemical dermatitis, those are reversible causes, mm -hmm. right? So I want to identify it so I can stop it but I just don't want to lock into that diagnosis and miss something more serious. Well, and I think it's important too, because this could easily just come through urgent care and you're looking at the hands, but are we looking at the rest of the body? Is, I mean, this is kind of a desquamating rash that we're seeing. Are we needing to think of something like an SJS or more of an infectious process? I think we need to keep that on our differential as well. Absolutely. I would be looking at their conjunctiva. Mm -hmm. I'd be looking in their mouth and yep. other mucosal surfaces. I'd be asking about any new meds. Mm -hmm. This could be a bad fungal infection, right? There's so many things this could be. Mm -hmm. I think that just looking for any kind of really bad stuff that I don't want to miss. And then, like they discuss, this is going to be most likely a dermatology referral case. Absolutely, I think, you know, if vital signs are stable, he's well appearing, it's been there for four months. I mean, <laughs> I don't yeah. think we're gonna have a terrible outcome if we get him to a dermatologist in a couple days. Um, so what, 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 do you agree with the diagnosis of dyshydrotic eczema? I think eczema? so. Uh, I, I think that it, it does look like that. Ichthyosis is another thing that it could look a little bit more of a scaly appearance with mm -hmm. ichthyosis and generally more generalized. Mm -hmm. But I think that Gita is onto a very high on the differential, if not the absolute diagnosis. Right. And I love that she just jumped to the correct <laughs> no, yeah, diagnosis because honestly, strong work. <laughs> yeah, I, I am smarter than I am when it comes to Durham because I would look at that and have to take a good mm. long think and run through that differential. Right. But in fact, Gita is correct. This is dyshydrotic eczema. And uh, the correct thing to do is just refer this guy to Durham. Yeah, just treat him symptomatically. Love refer it. him to Durham. All right. So next up, in-house, we have the wonderful, amazing Jess Mason, and she is going to talk to us about our procedure of the month.
Britt, thank you so much for the handover. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're going to talk about hands. Uh, so let's get a little hands on, not handsy. Um, we're going to focus on tendon examination and digital blocks. So um, I'm going to cover how to examine the tendons, how to do a digital nerve block, different techniques for doing it, and then whether or not it's OK or safe to use epinephrine in that digital nerve block. So first, I think it's worth spending a couple minutes talking about how we examine the tendons of the hand. Let's look at this illustration blown up a little bit larger. This was done by one of our fabulous artists, Jay Weiner. And it's one of those things you have to look at pretty closely. And then you have to look at it again and again. So the tendons are drawn in blue and in purple. And let's focus first on the flexor tendons. Specifically, there's a flexor digitorum superficialis, which connects to the middle phalanx, and a flexor digitorum profundus, which connects at the distal phalanx. So unfortunately, examining the flexor tendons involves a little bit more than just being able to bend and open your fingers. Wouldn't it be nice if this was all you had to do for your hand exam? Unfortunately, it is a little bit more nuanced than that. So we're going to watch a short little video showing how you specifically isolate the FDS, flexor digitorum superficialis, and FDP, flexor digitorum profundus. To test the flexor digitorum superficialis, brace the other fingers in extension and ask the patient to flex at the PIP joint. The reason for bracing the other fingers is because the flexor digitorum profundus muscle comes from the forearm. Bracing the other fingers neutralizes that FDP muscle, so the only way that the patient can bend at the PIP is by using their flexor digitorum superficialis. To test the flexor digitorum profundus, Brace the finger at the middle phalanx and ask the patient to bend at the DIP joint or the distal knuckle. The only way that they can do this is with an intact FDP. The third, fourth, and fifth fingers share the same FDP muscle belly, so it's normal for these fingers to move together even when trying to isolate one finger, as shown. You can really see how important it is to isolate each individual tendon because you can get a false negative, right? You, it could look normal, but perhaps you're just getting engagement from a more proximal muscle belly. And so it's important that we document that we examine both the FDS and the FDP in isolation. Now let's look at the extensor tendons a little more closely. There so it starts as one, extensor tendon, and then you've got the lateral bands that come around the side and the central slip that goes down the middle and the emergency exits are to the side. So what if you get an injury right here at the lateral band? Okay, people out there watching, tell me the name of this injury. I know you know it. You have a lateral band injury. Look at it. What's it going to cause? It's going to cause a mallet finger. That's right. So an extensor tendon injury at the lateral bands you won't be able to extend at the distal IP joint. It's gonna sag down. This one you're probably not gonna miss. The patient's gonna have one of those classic presentations like they took a volleyball or a dodgeball straight onto their fingertip and now they can't extend it. That's why they're gonna come in and see you. And sometimes it causes a little bit of an avulsion fracture with this as well. Pretty easy to identify and also pretty easy to treat. You're gonna splint an extension for four to six weeks. What if there's an injury here at the central slip. What will that look like? So if you have an injury there, you can see, and I'm going to hopefully get this right, over time, and it's not going to look like this right away, but over time you're going to get some flexion at the proximal IP joint and hyperextension at the distal IP joint. Over time, and I'm talking several weeks, this is going to lead to a boutonniere deformity. But a closed central slip injury is commonly missed on that initial presentation. Unless you have a big laceration right over your finger, you can easily miss this. Fortunately, there are a couple of examination maneuvers we can do to isolate and test for that central slip injury. The Elson and the modified Elson test. So let's take a quick look at a video demonstrating how to do these really important exam maneuvers. Have the patient curl their fingers around the edge of a table or a box with their fingers flexed at the PIP. And then they extend their finger while you apply pressure to the middle phalanx. If the central slip is intact, you'll feel tension as the finger is extended. In this case, there is not much tension, which is concerning for a central slip injury. 
So this patient needs close follow-up with a hand surgeon. The modified Elson test has the benefit of comparing the injured finger to the same finger on the other hand. The patient touches together their thumbs and the middle phalanx of the finger being tested. They attempt to touch their fingertips together and they should not be able to do it because the central slip holds tension. So this is normal and it looks symmetric. In a central slip injury simulated here on the left hand, the left finger is straight at the DIP compared to the right hand. So once again, this is important to do that exam in the right patient and to document your findings. So examining the tendons, there's some nuance there that's very important that we do and that we document. Now let's move on to digital nerve blocks and let's blow this picture up a little bit bigger. This is by one of our illustrators, Dave Mason. And I wanna point out that there's actually two sets of digital nerves on each finger. You've got your dorsal digital nerves, and then you have volar digital nerves, also known as palmar, also known as anterior. I don't know why it has three names, just to make it confusing. But these are at 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock. Now when we look at the innervation of the digital nerves, I know this drawing kind of throws you off for a second because we're used to seeing the distribution of the median, ulnar, and radial nerves, but this is the distribution of the innervation of the digital nerves. And you can look at how the thumb and the small finger are a little bit different than the second, third, and fourth fingers. And if you're trying to get anesthesia of just a certain part of the finger, it can get a little bit confusing. Do I need to go after the dorsal nerves, the volar nerves? Let me make it nice and easy for you. Just anesthetize all of them. And then you don't have to worry about if you got the right nail better, if you got the whole finger. Just do both, get the whole finger numb, and then you don't have to worry about it. So here's three approaches for how to do a digital nerve block. For the dorsal approach to a digital nerve block, we're always gonna start by prepping the skin, position the patient with their palm downward and insert the needle at the dorsal web space. Advance the needle until it reaches the palmar aspect of the hand, but does not exit the palmar skin. We're not trying to skewer the finger. Aspirate and inject two to three mLs of anesthetic as the needle is withdrawn. This allows you to reach both the volar and the dorsal nerves with one injection, except you have to do a second injection because you have to repeat this on the other side of the finger. That's the downside. That approach is so common, also called the classic approach because it is so common, but let's go through another approach. The volar approach is also called a transthecal block or flexor tendon sheath block since the anesthetic is injected into and spreads along the flexor tendon sheath. With the patient's hand resting palm up, insert the needle at the midpoint of the crease where the finger meets the palm or just proximal to this over the metacarpal head, which is palpable. Advance the needle until you touch bone and then back it off just a little bit. Aspirate and inject three mLs of anesthetic. This should anesthetize all four digital nerves, but a nice adjunct is to slightly withdraw and re-angle the needle tip towards each web space, delivering a little more anesthetic to each side. After the injection, the patient can hang their arm down, letting that anesthetic spread with gravity. And that particular block was performed by one of our MRAP faculty, Dr. Jesse Werner. So that volar approach was first described way back in 1991. It was studied on cadavers um, using methylene blue injection, um, which spread circumferentially around that proximal phalanx. So you can see from the spread of the methylene blue that you're getting involvement of all of the digital nerves. So how precise do you have to be? Do you have to go right into that flexor tendon sheath? Because I'm not sure I can confidently say, oh yeah, I felt the pop and I was in it. Well, good news here. There was a comparison of a flexor tendon sheath injection with a volar, just subcutaneous injection at the same site. And they were found to be equivalent in onset, distribution, and duration. So don't worry too much that you're exactly in the flexor tendon sheath. Turns out, doesn't matter. It's still gonna be just as effective. Let's take a look at one more approach to digital nerve blocks. The web space approach to a digital nerve block is quite simple, shown here on a toe instead of a finger. Once the skin is prepped, introduce the needle into the web space with the needle tip aiming right down the middle. Aspirate, then inject two to three mLs of anesthetic on each side. Ideally, this should anesthetize both the dorsal and volar digital nerves, especially since it's a small space. 
So three ways of doing a digital nerve block. There's more out there, and it probably doesn't matter too much which one you choose. They're all going to be roughly equivalent in how effective they are. Moving on to the topic I really wanted to talk about tonight, epinephrine. If you do a digital block, should you use just plain lidocaine, or what about using lidocaine with epinephrine? Is it going to make your finger or your toe fall off, or your patient's finger or toe fall off? So here's why this is even a concern. Epinephrine causes vasoconstriction. Obviously, it's a presser. If someone comes in with a bleeding scalp wound, the first thing you do is reach for lidocaine with epi to help control the bleed. Now that could potentially lead to some ischemia, and over time, the concern is could it become gangrenous or necrotic? So is this a myth or is it a fact? This is the paper that most people cite. It's a large systematic review that looked at cases from 1880 to 2000. They identified 48 reported cases of ischemia and necrosis, and most of those used cocaine or procaine, and those are not the first things that I reach for for a digital block. Only 21 of those 48 even used epinephrine, and 17 of them had an unknown concentration with a manual dilution. There was multiple confounders, and this is key. Zero of those cases occurred when commercially available lidocaine with epinephrine was used. This speaks pretty, pretty strongly that you can probably use lidocaine with epinephrine and do so safely. And to add to this, oh, let me point out, some of those confounders in these cases actually speak to the risk factors of what makes a patient more likely to have ischemia. And it's the things that you would think, right? Peripheral vascular disease, rheumatologic disease, tourniquets, if the patient has a concurrent infection or is doing hot soaks. There's also been multiple very large studies, hundreds of patients, lots of literature, mainly in the hand surgery literature, where they've compared lidocaine and bupivacaine with and without epinephrine and ropivacaine. And they didn't report any ischemic complications. So once again, this sort of speaks to the potential or at least theoretical safety of using epinephrine in our digital blocks. But let's get a little bit nervous about it. Okay, in 2021, there were three papers published that make me a little bit leery, more than a little bit. So here's one from the archives of orthopedic and trauma surgery. 17 patients who were undergoing a hand surgery, usually like a trigger finger release, using lidocaine with epinephrine. They put continuous monitoring on their finger of their oxygen saturation, hemoglobin volume in the capillaries, and relative blood flow to the fingertips. Four of those patients developed a critical oxygen level of less than 10%. It lasted 130 seconds on average, and it completely resolved in those four patients. Four patients had a critical oxygen level. I think that's a bit concerning. And to add that to that, we had this huge time period from 1880 to 2000 with no case reports of digital ischemia. And then comes along 2021, where we get two papers that speak to this. So we know that there's transient ischemic insult that patients mostly recover from if they get epinephrine in their finger. But the big question is, which patients are not going to recover and under what circumstances and are you willing to take that chance? So here's those two papers I mentioned. The first one, a case report. Um, the patient did not know that she had Raynaud's phenomena. It only came out later as they were questioning her about why could this have happened. And these two photos that you see are this case. She had ischemia, sloughing of her skin, and long-term disability where she couldn't properly flex at that joint. In the second case, makes me pretty nervous, a patient went to the dermatologist for removal of a couple warts from their finger and had a lidocaine with epinephrine injection. And that patient not only developed ischemia, but had necrosis and autoamputation of their distal phalanx. So are you gonna take that risk? I, I don't know, is it safe or is it not? Here's where I fall on the issue. There is no benefit and therefore no good reason to use it. Why take the chance? I really think the burden of proof should be in the other direction. Prove to me that it's more effective or beneficial to the patient to use lidocaine with epinephrine, and then I'll consider using it. But let me pose this question to our group here. Do you use lidocaine with epinephrine? Not generally, and I'll tell you, I agree with you that I don't think there's any benefit because remember, 
The reason why the epinephrine is in there is to keep the lidocaine to work longer. It's not to cause a bloodless field or anything else. And if you need an anesthetic to last longer, use pepivacaine. Use a yes. longer acting anesthetic. Do not necessarily need to use a lido with epi. If you do this, you will get blanching. You will get color change. Now, will they lose their finger? Probably not, because we have lots of clinical experience with people who inject themselves generally in their thumb with their EpiPen. But they will get dusky and they will get cool. If you do do this and somebody gets what appears to maybe may be ischemia, phentolamine is the reversal agent. That's an alpha blocking agent or an, al yeah, an alpha uh, an antagonist because this is alpha mediated. So if you're going to do it, make sure you have phentolamine. But I agree entirely with you, Jess. I don't think that there's a clinical benefit. Yeah, I mean, can you do it? Will their finger fall off? Probably not. I mean, you're talking about case reports, but we're also talking about fingers. These are very important parts of our body, and you really can become very disabled if that's not working properly. Is that worth it for just a little lack that you were sewing up? You know, myth or fact, you know, everyone wants to say like, well, I can do it. It's just epi and it's not going to cause problems. And, and in the vast majority of patients, it probably won't. But in a few patients, it will, and it can be a devastating mm. outcome, and it's not worth it. Thank you. I'm so glad that you agreed with me because I was ready to be like going to that for this. I'm sure there's people out there who are typing away in the comments about how they're going to, you know, it's safe and they're going to continue using it. But yeah, I, I think just be a little cautious. And if it's just as effective to use plain lidocaine, why not do that? Perfect. All right, guys. So we're going to wrap up and move to our next segment. We've got Swami with paper clips. All right, guys, let's hit paper clip number one. This is a study by Gerard and colleagues, higher sensitivity with the lever sign test for diagnosis of ACL rupture in the ED. This is in the ever so popular archives of orthopedics and trauma surgery. I know you guys read this one every month when it comes out, you're probably desperately waiting for it to arrive, but just in case this study slipped by it, let's go over what they did here and what they were looking at. It's basically looking at that atraumatic knee injury where you have a suspicion for an ACL tear. And we have some tools to kind of try and make this diagnosis, but we know those tools are sometimes a little limited. We've been taught the anterior drawer sign, the Lachman test, but sometimes these can be hard to perform when the patient has an acutely swollen knee. Either the swelling is too much to actually do this, the performance this, uh, the test, or the patient has too much pain to actually move them through that test. So this group looked at that and said, well, what about this lever sign test? Is that better than these other tests? And can we actually perform it in all these patients? So let's talk about what the lever sign test is. First, we're gonna pretend that this is the patient's leg, that this actually does look like a leg and here is the patient's knee. If this is their left leg, I'm gonna take my left fist and I'm gonna place it just distal to the knee. And that's gonna act as the fulcrum for my lever. So with that fist underneath the calf, just distal to the knee, I'm gonna then apply downward pressure to the distal thigh, just proximal to the knee, I'm gonna put downward pressure. If the ACL is intact, the foot is going to go up. That is a normal lever sign. If the ACL is out, the foot's not gonna go up. So this is a very simple test and it is creation of a lever. But the question then is how does it perform when we compare it to the other tests? In this study, the group had 52 patients. Now of those 52 patients, what they did was they put them through the anterior drawer test, the Lachman test, and the lever test, and then all of these patients got MRIs later on to confirm whether they had an ACL tear or not. 40 of the 52 patients had an ACL tear. And what's interesting is that 12 of the patients were only diagnosed with that tear based on the positive lever sign test. So the anterior drawer test, the Lachman's test were negative, but the lever test was positive in those 12 patients. So only one test was positive and it was the lever test. So that gives us a little bit of information. The other thing that they found was that there was a group of patients that they couldn't do an anterior drawer on. And there was a group of patients they couldn't do a Lachman test on because they were too painful, because the patient's knee was too swollen. When we look overall at the sensitivity and specificity of these tests, what we find is that the anterior drawer test is somewhere in the 50 range for the sensitivity. Not too great. But the specificity with the anterior drawer is actually pretty good. It's somewhere around 82%. So anterior drawer, this is how it performs. 
How about that Lockman test? The Lockman test actually performed a little worse. The sensitivity was about the same somewhere in the 50s, but the specificity was also somewhere in the 50s. So not all that useful. How does the lever test compare to these? Well, the lever test had a much higher sensitivity. The lever test had a sensitivity of 92%. So by far, it was the best out of the three. High sensitivity, which is what we want in the emergency department. We wanna make sure we're not missing a lot of these injuries. So high sensitivity is good. Unfortunately, the specificity was only about 25%. So not great specificity with that lever test. But how do we put all of this together? And, and does this really tell us that we can just do a lever test and move on? I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. There are some weaknesses here. Everybody who was doing this study knew the hypothesis. They knew that they wanted the lever test to look good, and perhaps that introduces some bias. The other weird thing is this low specificity with the lever test. Does that mean that there's a bunch of people with normal knees, and when you push down and do a lever test, their foot doesn't go up? Because that's what it would have to be to have that low specificity, and we don't really have that information. So that's a little bit of a strange thing that we found in this study. But overall, what I think this tells us is that when we see these patients, we should be adding the lever test to our physical exam maneuvers. This is gonna help us to figure out which patients, if they have that positive lever test, meaning I push down on the knee, I push down on the thigh, and the foot doesn't go up, they should probably be being referred to sports medicine or orthopedics a little bit more expeditiously. So I think that the lever test can really be helpful here in figuring out which patients need that expeditious referral versus which patients maybe can just go with regular follow-up, go for their primary care follow-up, and then move on from there. Lever test, definitely something that we should be adding to our physical exam testing, something that we should be doing for that atraumatic knee when we're worried about an ACL tear. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, Swami. That's a great description of a great test. I know that I personally don't really like doing the other tests for ACL injuries, so it's something I've added to my repertoire. Actually, Mill had me film a video with him doing it. Uh, it's a great video, highly recommend watching. Doesn't look creepy at all, me cranking on his leg. His leg looks very similar to Swami's drawing, actually. Uh, almost the exact <laughs> same anatomy. Mel's got very uh, jacked legs, as we would say, in the athletic industry. Uh, but you can check it out uh, as part of the Daily Dose. Um, so we posted this video here for free. If you have your phone out right now at home, if you're watching, you can look at the QR code uh, and join on the Daily Dose mailing list. And whenever there's new Daily Dose that are posted, uh, we post one video Monday through Friday every single day. It's like a short little tidbit of education right in your inbox. And there's a bunch of free ones too. So if you're watching and you're not an MRAP or UC Max subscriber, um, you're gonna get that goodness either way. It'll be really great. So. On to our next segment. We're really excited about this. Normally we end each night with a case, but last time we got into some really interesting questions. And so we thought, what if we just asked a few kind of controversial clinical questions of all the minds in the room right now, see our differences in our clinical pattern or practice and kind of hang out around the water cooler. So we're gonna do some water cooler questions. Everyone's saying that sounds like me sipping out of water right now, and now I'm really. I think it is. That was, I, I think sat you in front of the mic. Really <laughs> refreshing. All right, so you guys ready for some questions about how you practice medicine? Uh, nothing too hard. Should be pretty straightforward. We'll do a few little case vignettes, and then we'll dive a little into the evidence. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right, so let's talk about the first patient, the first case. So you're working in urgent care, and you've got a guy who comes in. He's like 43 years old. He has a history mm -hmm. of diabetes. Thinks it's pretty well controlled, and his foot looks like this. He's got this ulcer on the bottom of his right foot. He thinks it's been there for like maybe a few days. He's not really sure, but he also noticed he doesn't have the best sensory exam on the bottom of the foot. So you're a little worried about his overall diabetes course. So what are you guys kind of thinking and how would you approach this patient? Well, I'm thinking that he's probably got a diabetic foot infection. Um, you know, it doesn't, I can't, I can't see too well, but it doesn't look like very red, pussy, a deep ulcer. Um, but sometimes the deepness of those can be a little tricky until you actually start to probe. And I know, Jess, I think you have uh, some some techniques for probing. But I, I think, you know, if he if his vital signs are good, he's well appearing, he's not febrile. I don't think this looks like 
super acutely infected. What do you think? We're just chuckling over here at the, the, I know, the just I know. probing I, technique. I, I realize. <laughs> I have <laughs> techniques. Yeah, I just imagine I you as an interrogator right now. I'm just being like, and now I'm turning where is the pus? So. <laughs> the two waterboards yeah. to find yeah. out if there's osteomyelitis. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. You uh, know what I mean. I yeah, we got you. We got you. Yeah, 100%. But we all are going to sit up in our chairs when we have a diabetic foot mm -hmm. wound, right? And say, hey, we don't want to miss something because mm -hmm. they're at risk for bad infections. They're at risk for bad bugs. And we just want to see. And of course, I think the leading question is, Scott, is something brewing underneath this besides maybe just a localized infection? Yeah, totally. And I'm, and I'm hearing from you, Britt, is that the physical exam is a huge part of your workup yeah. for osteo. Because that's what we're really worried about here, like osteomyelitis. It's like, sure, we can have a soft tissue infection, but has it gone down to the bone in this patient? that can't really feel their foot and they're very much at risk for this type of infection. And they can really hide a lot under there, right? Like Absolutely. the second you do start to probe there or just unroof it and you're like, wow, this is a lot deeper and a lot more pus than I was expecting. So you really do have to examine that foot. You guys ordering MRIs in your outpatient urgent care? You don't have you an know, MRI? I'd in fire it up. You know. <laughs> I won't see them until the MRI is done. Yeah. So it, better be, it better be done before they see me. But, but x rays, I mean, we should talk about x rays. Sure. Right? Yeah, we start I mean, with I, that's a pretty standard thing to order is mm -hmm. to get an x ray, maybe get some labs. Um, I'm, I'm doing that for sure. Um, and I think also really leaning on that history, how rapidly did this progress you know is this something that's been around for a long time you're being followed for it has something changed about it recently mm -hmm. has pain suddenly worsened um, certainly any systemic symptoms would be very concerning so uh, putting all those pieces together but the x-ray is going to be helpful just in case um, low chance in someone who looks like this is probably a fir first time ulcer not very advanced at this stage but you're looking for that kind of moth-eaten appearance of the bone which would be very concerning for osteo. Totally, and, and sort of how does the, the time course thing is such an important point that you bring up, and sometimes, you know, in this hypothetical case, the patient doesn't have a great sensory exam, maybe they can't tell us the exact time it's been there for, but your guys' treatment, your, your approach to the chronic osteo in the diabetic patient versus like this acute situation is a little bit different when you're thinking about disposition and a few other things, right? Yeah, and timing of how long it's been there can be kind of tough because sometimes they have these horrible wounds and they're like, it just appeared yesterday. And you're like, right. well, probably not. But because their sensory exam is so poor and they just don't know it's there. And I think that's really good. So I agree with Jess entirely. I mean, radiograph, he could have a foreign body in there. He doesn't feel his feet. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is just completely an aside, but I speak to all these patients and their family members say, you need to look at your feet between your toes every week yes. because they come and say, oh, this, it's like, this has not been there <laughs> for two days. This has been there for a long time. Right. Of course, there is the delay in radiographic evidence of osteomyelitis a week or two. So the absence of onion skinning and all the other moth in appearance, just because it's negative doesn't mean that they can have it. But if it's there, it at least helps you along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as part of the clinical approach, there's a, a few pieces of literature that I found really helpful. Sometimes it's really tough. Like, obviously, your urgent care setting might be different, and you might have access to an ESR, or CRP, a full set of labs, and maybe even MRI if you're super lucky, <laughs> I guess. Bougie. Yeah. That's bougie. <laughs> bougie care. Um, but uh, most people don't, and they might not even have access to some of those inflammatory markers. So um, there's a few papers that I think are really important to help kind of lay out the clinical approach. Um, one for me is from the Rational Clinical Exam. This is a JAMA paper that really asks the question, does this patient have osteomyelitis? Um, and two of the most important physical exam findings were the ulcer size. So more than two centimeters squared is like very much associated with somebody that has osteo in the lower extremity. And then a positive probe to bone test, the PTB, um, to help be helpful establishing the diagnosis. And they found in this like meta-analysis and this, re this honestly review, um, things like the ESR and CRP and even plain radiographs, they could be helpful in increasing your likelihood, but you're not going to be slam dunk. You know, some of the like very either acute or very, very chronic ones might not have those elevations that you're looking for. And, and Sean, as you were saying about the, the changes on radiography might mm -hmm. take some time. Um, are these things that you generally do for these folks when you're looking? I mean, I haven't, I, I would eyeball the size. I'm not like out there with my ruler and measuring two <laughs> centimeters square, but it's, it's a lot smaller than you might think, actually. You know? I think the probe to bone test, and I know that Jess has some great video, right, that she's going to share about that. I think that you have to, just like uh, Britt was saying, you unroof these sometimes or just move a little bit, and it goes a lot deeper than, than you think. I think the reactive markers, whether you can or can't get them, you know, there's probably going to be no matter if something's going on, it's probably going to be on the little high side. So I don't know that that helps me a lot. 
it might help your consultant because they're definitely going to ask if you have to refer mm -hmm. this person on to the ED or something like that from urgent care. Absolutely, and there's two papers that EMA actually reviewed in some abstracts. Interestingly enough, they're both abstract 22. That must be our slot for the huh. diabetic foot osteo <laughs> when we review these papers. Um, that actually looked at the laboratory uh, evaluations, if they're even really helpful, um, and also the probe to bone tests that are, I think are a great review. Um, and both of these actual abstracts are included in that JAMA study. But Jess, we've heard, we've heard about your probing technique. Tell <laughs> us a little bit about it. Okay, yeah, tell I'm us about an the probing. expert prober. So let's take a look at this video. And it's very simple how you do it. Um, you're gonna wanna use a metal instrument. Um, I know that the default is the, the wood end of the cotton-tipped applicator, but don't use that. That's softer. You won't, you won't have such as much sensitivity to detect it. Use a metal instrument, probe around till you find the deepest pocket, and you're trying to feel for touching bone. And if you can feel bone, obviously bone is exposed. That has um, been correlated very strongly with osteomyelitis. So very easy to do. You might not have ESR, CRP available in the urgent care, but you got some tweezers, so <laughs> go go probe, go probing. And I, and I also want to point out, like, this foot, I am much more worried about osteo Absolutely. compared to that image that you just showed me before. This, this is going to be osteo. That other one, I, it, maybe it's been there for a while, maybe right. there's some chronic bone infection, but, like, acute osteo, I think, is going to be in that one. I'm not so worried about the foot that we saw previously. Yeah, and, and I'll say, just to, to piggyback off of that, that probing, like, in the one EMA abstract that's reviewed, the actual probe to bone test in some studies has similar test characteristics to MRI. Really? Um, which is pretty fascinating to me. And uh, I'll have to go back and look and see if that's what they actually did with the metal. But I, I totally agree with you. I had a uh, teacher tell me about switching to a metal instrument at one point. And it's almost like the difference when you're trying to feel um, the guitar strings when you're doing a lateral canthotomy. Mm -hmm. Like the, that twanging or that, that subtle vibration you can get as the metal strokes across the bone is just way more tangible than on like a soft wood instrument. So um, it definitely changed my practice. All right, you guys done with osteo? You feel good about? I'm done with feet. You're done, you're done with feet? <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, so let's move on to our next very common clinical situation. So we have someone coming into our urgent care who's got this eye. It is a little bit painful, a little bit teary, a little bit blurred vision. They maybe had some URI stuff over the last day or so. Maybe they even have some history of like allergic rhinitis, whatever. Um, they just want to know if this is contagious and if they need to do anything about it. How do you generally approach this patient? What are you thinking about? So we just start from the red eye, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so was there trauma? I want to know that. You're giving me URI symptoms. I'm kind of thinking that you're leading me down the viral conjunctivitis thing. Is it bilateral? Is it unilateral? Did it start suddenly? Um, any foreign body sensation, which they might just have from a viral conjunctivitis, it's just itchy and irritated. Um, but is there any history of anything going in their eye? Do they wear contact lenses? I mean, I think there's a lot of just history that you can take from that patient that can really help narrow your differential diagnosis. Uh, absolutely. Do they wear contact lenses too, right? That's going to be another one for me. Any STI kind of complaints, right? Could this be a uveitis, right? They really didn't notice any perilimbal sparing there. So you just start thinking, uh, hey, probably nothing super bad, but you definitely have to do a detailed exam in history. Can I just say that that's pink eye, y'all? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what that is. Um, but having worked in academics for my entire career, um, you know. It's never just pink eye, then. We gotta, we gotta go through that whole different, never yeah. That one's totally pink eye. But I have, you know, thorough residents that come present patients, and by the time they presented the patient, they've done like way more than I would. They've got ocular pressures, they've got slit lamp exams on, just like pink eye. Um, and I'll tell you, it's really surprised me what I, I credit the residents, and I've learned so much from them because some of them have come and presented the patient to me that looks like pink eye, and they say, But I did the fluorescein stain, and something doesn't look normal. And we look at it, and, and it's a dendritic keratitis, and that patient actually has ocular herpes. Uh, or herpes keratitis. And so, you know, the question that you raised was, do you need to fluorescein every conjunctivitis? Um, that sounds a little bit extreme, but if you don't, you will miss herpes keratitis. Once, once in a while, that's the needle in the haystack. That's what sort of we're trained to do is find the needle in the haystack, right? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I know it's not my practice to 
floor scene every single one of these eyes that comes in, especially with like a feeling a slam dunk pink eye story I know, and everything that's else, pink eye. especially no trauma, nothing else. Um, but it is an interesting point because you're right, especially when I also work in an academic center, everyone's always practicing their eye exam. And then I think even taking it one step further is like after you've fluorescein the eye, how are you examining it? Is this like we talked about at the beginning around like a little cobalt blue on the iPhone or using an ophthalmoscope. Or taking a selfie. Yeah, because like <laughs> I think there's pretty good evidence at this point and certainly anecdotal experience I've had like without using the slit lamp, you miss stuff. There's stuff that you should definitely be able to see when you would think you'd see with a fluorescein exam, but really getting in there, those small ulcers, those small abrasions could really be concerning. Do you all just slit lamp these folks or are you dusting off the cobwebs from the slit lamp? Uh, well, you know? and I, I think, you know, not every clinical practice is, has a slit lamp. So if you do, yes, I actually really do like to do the slit lamp again. You can pick up some subtle things that you weren't expecting, those dendritic lesions, a foreign body in there that you really didn't think you were gonna find. Um, and we only get better at doing these exams the more we do them. They're not invasive, it's not painful for the patient. To, it's a little bright, but, um, I, so I do do a slit lamp and fluorescein exam. Do you have to? Does that have to be the 100% rule that you always follow? Absolutely not. And if you only have a woods lamp, then you use what you got. But. For me, a slit lamp is definitely superior. And I agree with Britt, and I work at an urgent care where there's one, but it generally is broken, right? <laughs> so the other thing is the woods lamp. And I have picked up things on the slit lamp that I did not see on the woods lamp. And I take a lot of the history while I'm doing my exam. It doesn't take that long, mm -hmm. really. If like you go through and let's say it isn't a slam dunk pink eye, Right, you want to look at the anterior chamber. Do you see yeah. cell and flare? Yeah. Do I see a subtle hypopion that I'm not seeing with the naked eye? All this kind of thing. So if it's available, I'm going to do it. And it really doesn't take me that long to do because I preparacane them. If I get pain relief, that tells me this is the front of the eye, conjunctival. If it's not, I'm thinking this is something behind the conjunctiva. And then uh, I'm doing this all in concert while I'm doing my slit lamp exam, if it's available. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Actually, Jess, you asked this question and brought the example of the um, zoster keratitis up. And after we talked about it some time ago, I was like, oh my God, how many of these? How many yeah, have I missed? What? Yeah. And so, like, I, I've Probably been, not that yeah. <laughs> One. Uh, and, like, for me, like, I, I've reflected on my own practice and, and kind of something you said there, Sean, really resonates with me. It's all about, too, like, that painful symptom that patients mm -hmm. are having. Like, I get pretty aggressive with the uh, pen light ophthalmoscope when I'm doing my exam. And, like, if they have photophobia, like, they're definitely going to, if they didn't before, they're going to have some photophobia by the time we're done <laughs> examining the patient. And, um, you know, and I think that it's actually borne out a little bit in the literature too, at least for when we've applied a topical analgesic, which is a really great abstract that we actually covered on EMA. Um, it's an oldie but a goodie, 1989. It's still incredibly cited in the literature. I know we covered it in 1990. This, you know, this predates me, which is exciting, um, like oh, on that wow. literature, you know, like, yes, finally talking about some of those oldies but goodies. But um, really in this study, You're they- You're making us feel really old. I'm sorry, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> Finally, we're getting to that point. Um, but I think what's really exciting about this paper is that th the providers in it really missed a lot of corneal abrasions, ulcerations that were supposedly to be seen on fluorescein exam. And the patients were later diagnosed on a subsequent follow-up like uh, slit lamp exam. Um, but the thing that was very well associated with whether or not they had an abrasion or ulceration was did they get topical relief from that topical analgesic. Um, so if you're gonna do your fluorescein exam or maybe you don't have access to a great slit lamp, like really taking the time to reassess the patient's symptoms after you've applied the, that preparacane, that tetracaine, whatever you're putting in the eye. And um, they get pretty immediate relief. Yes. You <laughs> They're seen, like, oh my gosh, yeah. doctor, yes. You know what's interesting? A few years ago, there was a shortage of proparacaine, and so many departments switched to tetracaine. Yeah. A lot of places didn't switch back. So we're still stocking tetracaine, mm -hmm. and the onset of action is slower than proparacaine. And that's important to know because I was so used to you know, here comes the drop, yes. you're gonna feel better yeah. in 10, <laughs> nine, eight. Not true with yeah. tetracaine, unless you wanna do like a three minute countdown. Don't and do that. have you actually ever had it in your eye? It steams, it, it you really have burns. You yeah. tell them like this hurts and then it goes away. Yes, yeah. Because it isn't the instant relief and it actually causes more pain before it gets better. Yes, I agree with that. You know, preparing them to do it. And I always have them just to look away a little bit because sometimes people get freaked out when things are going towards their eye. But they do generally with preparing get pretty immediate relief and mm -hmm. like say the thank God, doctor, thank you. And usually uh, it ends there, right? You do your exam and you say, okay. Yeah. Either you have something or you don't, and they go on with their happy lives. 
Yeah, we just did that switch at one of the places I worked at the Tetracaine and I didn't know the burning. And oh, I felt yeah. so bad that yeah. first patient. I was like, ooh. <laughs> it, you know, and like, I only know because I yeah, okay. have actually, I wear contacts and I had a corneal abrasion and they put it in my eyes and I was like, not prepared that that was going to hurt and then get better. <laughs> All right, we're good on eye stuff right now. Want to move on to something? So oh. feet, eye, what's next? Yeah, <laughs> where, where are we going? We're going to their belly. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So we've got a young woman, otherwise healthy. Um, she is not pregnant. Yes, yeah, Scott. I know Emma, we had a debate about this, this sure? photo. <laughs> she's not pregnant. We're going to assume she's not pregnant. Uh, who's coming in with some lower abdominal pain for like the last two days, some dysuria, urgency, frequency. Um, this is coming into your office. And you're concerned she might have a UTI. Is this somebody right off the bat that you're dropping a UA on and you're going to look for that result to guide your therapy? Or how do you think through that? Well, I don't start go till I find out if she's pregnant or not, sure. right? I mean, it's yeah, like was, all yes. roads lead to pregnancy or not. I know you said she's not, but just to hammer that home to everybody, you need to find out whether this person is pregnant or not. Absolutely. And then it sounds like it's a pretty straightforward cystitis, but I want to get a little more history and see if there's anything subtle that maybe makes it a little bit more complicated. Yeah, I mean, it does sound like a straightforward forward UTI, just like it sounded like a straightforward viral conjunctivitis, mm -hmm. but our job is to think worst first, right? So ruling out pregnancy and then also getting a history of, you know, why else could it be irritated down there? Does she have, is she sexually active? Does she have a history of STDs? Does she have risk factors for a yeast infection? And I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. I'm not saying we need to do a pelvic exam on everybody, but I think getting that history is really important. And for me, you know, I, I would get a UA. It's uh, low cost, not invasive. It helps give me an answer. Also can help me give, get a culture if for some reason she's prone to having many of these and maybe has been resistant to antibiotics in the future or in the past. Uh, so I, I would get the UA. Absolutely. I'm getting the UA every single time. It's going to answer both of those questions, pregnant or not, and is there possibly a urinary tract infection. One approach that I usually do is I'll say, look, let's order the urinalysis. If it looks like a slam dunk urinary tract infection, great. We'll treat you for that and let you go on your way. If it doesn't look really consistent with a UTI, then we might need to do some additional tests, maybe a pelvic exam, get some swabs. So that's my, my general, my general approach, approach before just going straight to pelvic everyone. Is there anybody that you would empirically treat for UTI? No testing. They come in, they're like, listen, I've had 45 urinary tract infections before in my life. This feels like the 46. Sounds like they need a I urine culture. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, but do they but, need a urinalysis for treatment? But, no, I hear what you say. And yeah. you know, it, the, it, you, you could bring up that she hasn't had anything to drink and she just absolutely cannot pee and give you a drop of urine to take a sample from and she's going to be in there for hours just trying to do this urine and what you could just give her some macrobit and call it a day uh you know i guess you could you could I don't think there's any hard and yeah, fast rule you know, that you have to have the urine um if it's young healthy no complications otherwise sure yeah. i would like to know the pregnancy though we, we have the ability to do the test, and so yeah. I think that it's our due diligence to do the test. However, sometimes you get that patient who's like, I got to go pick up my kids. I'm leaving. Can you please just, yeah, sure. Let's, this is probably a UTI. I'm not going to. You're not going to let it go to pilo. So, no, <laughs> we're just going to give you some antibiotics and have you follow up with your doctor. So conversely, diving into it a little bit more, I'm obsessed with urine, apparently. Um, well, that's weird. So <laughs> let's say that we have someone who has all those things. This is my 46 UTI. I have all the symptoms, all that stuff. The, you get the urine back, and the spec grav is like one. It's like pure water. Like, this patient has been hydrating like crazy. So it's the most dilute urine sample imaginable. Totally negative. Is that somebody that you're saying, we're not going to give you antibiotics, you should go home with your cystitis or UTI, and we'll call you? Or because you have so many symptoms, and it feels like your last UTI, I'm going to treat you empirically despite it, this test. I definitely have treated people that have told me, like, Doc, this is... And I've had that urine grow a culture that's positive, and, and ones that I've said, hey, we can call you back. So if it is otherwise an uncomplicated cystitis, it's screaming cystitis, and they've been through this a bunch of times before, and if I do have the luxury of looking at previous cultures and mm -hmm. everything's just like straightforward E. coli, pan-sensitive, right? I think that, you know, Jess had brought up earlier, uh, before we were on, like telemedicine colleagues make these diagnoses. A primary care physician who gets a phone call might feel comfortable doing this, right? So 
I do think it it causes pause though, right? And like Jess was saying, we need to do a little bit of a deeper dive. We need to really ask some history about, you know, are they at risk for STDs or other things that could be causing discomfort down there? Because a really clean urine, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily rule out that they don't have a urinary tract infection. And I'd still treat them if I, you know, do a deeper history and a little bit more of a physical exam. And I'm still like, yeah, this is pretty consistent with a UTI and I'm not worried about anything else. Mm -hmm. But it, it does, it does, it should cause pause Absolutely. so that you think a little bit deeper on your differential. Definitely. Yeah, I think I think one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by this question is like the UA is kind of like the like the Jackson Pollock of like bedside tests. It's like <laughs> it's up for our interpretation. There's not like a the dimer is elevated, the dimer is not elevated, the trope is positive, whatever. Like you have to how many cells if you've got microscopy or if you're actually looking at the strip, right? It's like is that really that color on there? You know, like there's a <laughs> lot. We talk a lot about like uh, operator dependent tests when we talk about ultrasound. But in a lot of ways, the UA is like that too. Um, so I went on a deep dive because I had a lot of patients in one of the areas that I work in that are like, yeah, I was having urine symptoms and like I got an antibiotic and I feel better, but I just want to be sure because this doctor just talked to me for a bit and then they gave me some antibiotics and they did no testing. And I was like, who are these people doing all this stuff? You know, <laughs> of course we need tests. This is what we do in medicine. Um, and I found this JAMA rational, again, clinical uh, evaluation article that's really fascinating. Um, and I think if you're at all interested in pre-test, post-test probability medicine, uh, if you're a Bayesian nerd, um, it's pretty incredible because I think this test is up for the most debate about the utility of the urinary uh, uh, analysis, the urine analysis rather, in a woman with a high probability of having a UTI. And so they found that if you had like all the slam dunk symptoms, um, a negative UA might not actually have enough power mm -hmm. to say that this person doesn't have a UTI, which obviously clinically we've all been chatting about that and that's our practice. But also suggest if they have all the slam dunk symptoms, you're not really gaining anything outside of maybe a culture mm -hmm. in some cases. And I think, Sean, you brought up like telemedicine providers or primary care providers, mm -hmm. oftentimes will just take that phone call and feel comfortable with that. Um, and if you're in an urgent care setting, like between those two worlds, or you're in an emergency mm -hmm. department fast track setting between those two worlds, maybe it's something that we should feel a little more comfortable doing ourselves um, if we don't have availability of those tests or if we're on the fence about our own interpretation of the UA. Um, to your point though, Britt, in this paper also, anyone with vaginal complaints like discharge, like that needs to be investigated further. So um, I think it does also raise an interesting question of like, who do you just treat for PID? Mm -hmm. Is there an, a role for empiric treatment of PID in some of these cases where you do the pelvic and you maybe don't find anything and how do you guys practice? Well, we're not gonna get those swab results back right away, right? So, no. I mean, for me, if they're high risk, if they're sexually active, they've had an infection before, they have multiple partners, they don't use um, uh, contraception, you know, I, I have a conversation with them because in the end they need to choose if they're gonna do this or not. And I, I think most of the times when you have an honest conversation with them, some people reasonably are like, let's just do the swabs and I'll wait and that that's okay. Um, and some people just wanna start the medications empirically, get their shot, get their pills, they just want to get that base covered and be done with it. So I think it's a, a shared decision making before I just empirically do it. Um, but I think it all depends on the risk factors. You can't really diagnose PID though without doing the pelvic exam and having cervical motion tenderness. And I think that if they're the history, like you're saying, Britt, you're getting that additional history, they've got abdominal pain and vaginal discharge, that is concerning alone for PID. And so then I think we are obligated to do that pelvic exam sure. to, to make that diagnosis because the treatment is significantly different from just coverage for standard STIs. And my coverage for standard STIs, I'm also going to be testing for HIV and syphilis. And if you're in an area that's very endemic for syphilis, I think you empirically cover with penicillin as well. Yeah, and I think that's a, a really important point about obligating to like at least take it a step further if you don't if you have that lower abdominal pain especially if you don't have any other explanation mm -hmm. and i just put up here the cdc recommendations too as just a guiding principle because i feel like sometimes we don't get a great answer um you know like i'm sure we miss a whole boatload of people that have like endometriosis or something that like we just can't diagnose without like laparoscopy or something but like as a reminder the cdc is very liberal in the recommendation to treat women for pid because obviously there's a bunch of bad things that can happen infertility toa all this other terrible stuff um so if you know it's a pretty broad based definition so if you have someone who's at risk and they have lower abdominal pain with no other cause that we can find like that is enough to pull the trigger if you've really ruled out everything else that you can think of um, and i know talking to some of my uh, OBGYN colleagues like 
it's almost like everyone deserves at least a course of treatment and attempt for this if they have this unresolved lower abdominal pain, even mm -hmm. in the absence of other findings, just because sometimes it's really hard. The pelvic exam's not a perfect test. Cervical motion tenderness is not a perfect test. Even the swabs aren't a perfect test. So I think it's yeah. a pretty reasonable no, approach. I'm glad you brought up the CDC guidelines because uh, on balance, if there is no other explanation and you even have a high clinical suspicion, it is in that patient's benefit to empirically treat them, in my opinion. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think any other things to add? I think that wraps up our cases for the evening, our water cooler questions. I'm going to look into the chat real quick, see if people have been chatting along. If they have any questions, please throw them on in, and we'll try to answer them right now. I know there's been a whole bunch of great talk. There was a question about, um, and the woman, depending on age, I think this is a really important point, with the, like, especially if you're having dysuria, to think about other causes, like Absolutely. if you have like atrophic vaginitis or something. That yes, obviously would be age a is very, way. a huge factor there, right? And I think we were all just thinking, oh, okay, if we're going to just give antibiotics, we're thinking this is a 19 year old with no medical problems and we you know this isn't somebody with uh, uh, extensive comorbidities this isn't an older patient this is really young healthy well I'll tell you I had a case of an elderly woman she was in her late 70s who I thought was dysuria urine was okay so let's do the pelvic exam it's like it was gonna be atrophic vag vaginitis Turned out that she actually had long-standing herpes and she had a new partner that she didn't want to tell and she had burning every time she pees, her labia had all these uh, herpes lesions on it. And I said, well, this is just, you know, a herpes thing. You can't so just assume. Like, you, you cannot assume. assume. So yeah. when people say, oh, above 35 and below 35 for men, it's like, come on, no, no, yeah, no, no. Wait, wait till you hit 35. <laughs> you <know? laughs> can actually sit there and talk to the patient. It turns out that actually helps. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. some of this you stuff can out. get a lot from the physical uh, exam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and also, you know, it, that's a great comment from the viewer, uh, expanding out the differential, because other things can cause dysuria, hematuria, stones. It's another thing to sure. think about. Mm -hmm. So hopefully um, we're, we're considering that. And then you get into the possibly infected stone realm as well. So we want to consider that. And then you got to call a urologist at some point and that ruins everyone's day, <laughs> you know, <laughs> having to talk to urology. <laughs> Um, but and also I think like a big takeaway from all the things that we're talking about um, and I think we've we've mentioned a little bit is really like what's the patient's capacity for follow-up in a lot of these urgent care decisions mm -hmm. I think yeah because I think like one of the nice safety blankets of working in an emergency department attached to a hospital is that you can always like kind of admit the patient you know at the end of the day <laughs> if you're really not sure or there's like other resources immediately available to you but if you're out there and like an urgent care that's in an isolated area maybe you're in a standalone emergency department um, you're taking the brunt of a lot of discharges or hey, like we're gonna transfer this person to an urgent care or from an urgent care to an ED, which is a whole big decision. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think really spending that extra minute and making sure the patient's plugged in somewhere mm -hmm. or that you or someone else can help make that phone call um, to ensure that follow-up. I know for me, it changes everything about yeah, the absolutely. decision. Yeah. And I mean, we made the comment that, you know, uh, primary care doctors do this all the time. They ca Somebody calls in, they can't get an appointment, but it sounds like a UTI, just treat them. But they have the luxury that they're gonna see that human right. again. And in an urgent care, in an ED setting, we may never see them again and they be they're lost to follow up and we don't have the right contact information to see if they're doing better and so you you know yes with the urine if it seems a slam dunk i guess you could do it without the, doing the ua but remember like we don't have that close right. follow up and that regular we're not going to see this person regularly we may never see them again yeah if all goes well we do our job perfectly uh, they'll never see us again. It'll be great. <laughs> we won't have any further emergencies, no other urgent needs. Um, True. Your practice setting changes how you practice. And just like we don't necessarily have the luxury of follow-up and continuity, we also have tests available in different settings, mm -hmm. different tests available. That's right. And we sort of have the obligation to do the test because it's available to us. So if I'm working, I've worked some telehealth shifts and sure, I'll treat empirically for a urinary tract infection based off the history alone. That's all I have to go off of. Mm -hmm. But if I have the ability to do a urinalysis or a dip, why would I not do it to help, you know, solidify that diagnosis? Totally agree. Well, this was a great discussion, guys. Thanks. So hopefully next time we'll get some more controversial questions and really tease our practice apart here. And maybe, you know, we can work on getting an actual water cooler here. Really <laughs> add to the vibe of uh, all hanging out in this space. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for watching tonight. Um, it's been a great chat. Uh, we'll still keep our eyes on the chat and we really appreciate all the energy that you brought. Also, I know 
You can't see everyone on the other side of the camera, but there's so many people who go into making this night possible, and I want to give a huge round of applause and thank you to the production team, MRAP support people, everyone, um, you know, even Mel, <laughs> who's in Sydney right now with his feet up somewhere, gets a thank you for We miss you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Just a reminder for you, uh, like, subscribe, all the doobly-doo down below if you want to keep following Grand Rounds when they're posted and get a reminder. And we also have this great QR code. We have, again, that mailing list that'll go out. Um, stay up to date with any of the other information information, freebies, good stuff that we'll be sending your way for both our MRAP ER content as well as our urgent care content through UC Max. That's all we have for you guys tonight. We're excited to see you next month in March for EM Grand Rounds. Really excited for it. Thanks, everyone. Bye.